that would be amazing. Um, but until then, uh, so hopefully a lot of you uh, took some time out uh, to you know, think about the importance of, of DAST uh, and incorporating that as part of your uh, your security testing workflow. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so it looks like, um, yeah, David, thank you for joining us. Sorry, we had a little bit of an IT problem there. The fun of uh, live streaming, um, but uh, <laughs> I will not take any more of your time. Uh, so if you want to correct us on the presentation, uh, uh, that'd be great. But uh, David, you've got the you've got the stage. Thank you, Alyssa. Appreciate it, and uh, nice to uh, nice to be here. Real pleasure to uh, be here at API Days. Uh, my name again is David Thomason, and uh, we got my title right. Worldwide Direct Director of Solutions. Solution Architects, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, but really my presentation today is about DART, uh, our API security strategy. And DART stands for Discover, Analyze, Remediate, and Test. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about that for a little bit. I got to catch uh, a part of Scott's presentation, uh, maybe the last half of it. And so, and I love it because it really goes hand in hand. Uh, he nailed it, that the conflict associated with uh, uh, between development teams and security teams has uh, has been pretty much constant, and uh, and we've said I've been in the security space for oh gosh uh, since 1986 when I was writing code for uh, Air Force Intelligence, and back then uh, you know things were a lot different. I was a terminal area security officer. We didn't even have desktops in in most of our organizations. Uh, so the question is why now? Why why do we need uh, the DART API security strategy. Well, I, I think we've seen and we all understand here at this conference why APIs are, APIs are mission critical. Everybody knows that the, the explosion over, of APIs over the past uh, five years, I'll say, uh, it has been just absolutely incredible. Um, and as Scott talked about in the last presentation, there is certainly uh, conflict between the security and the, and the dev teams. And I'd never seen Scott's presentation before, so I, I was really excited to hear that, that he just absolutely nailed this topic and I'm not gonna spend uh, an awful lot of time talking about it, but we don't need the security team. Uh, and, and trust me, I'm the security guy. I'm the one who in the past was always saying, no, 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 we gotta slow down, we gotta stop. We can't, we can't do this, there's a risk associated with it. And I got beat up and run over every single time because the business development team, the business team, uh, knew that we've got to have this to do business. And so we are going to, uh, we're going to do it right. Um, and so uh, we're going to get it out there. So obviously there's a big issue of uh, between security and development teams. Uh, there, there's also the issue of having this multi environment. And I stopped short of saying multi cloud because it might be multi cloud. It might be data center, physical data center. Uh, we work with customers all the time who've got five, six, seven, eight uh, different API gateways uh, in their environment. Everything is so convoluted and there's so much going on that it has become a challenge to make sure that we have all of the best practices for all those different environments, for all of those different platforms that we're deploying APIs through. Uh, and so as a result, we have these challenges going on uh, to, to make API security better. So that's why we've come up with the, with the DART and, and why it's important now. And, and I guess to exaggerate that point just a little bit more, uh, we have all, uh, here's all uh, a bunch of examples and I should have LinkedIn added to this list. I should have done it a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, all of these organizations had challenges with API security that resulted in thousands, if not millions of events or uh, of records uh, that were compromised uh, within their organizations. Uh, Gartner said by 2022, this has probably been repeated in the conference already a couple of times. What I'll say is that I meet with Gartner on a fairly regular basis. And one of the things that they told me was that they blew this prediction. Yeah, they were off by a year. It's uh, 2021 uh, that APIs will become the most frequent attack vector. It's already happened, they believe. And so this is, uh, this is a hot topic. It's why it's so important because it's getting so much media. I think it also is attracting, you know, the pen testers and uh, the black hats and uh, the bug bounty guys to all be looking for uh, vulnerabilities associated with 
uh, with APIs. It's front and center in the news. And so as a result, we're just going to see more and more attention being paid to it, which means that there's going to be more logos on this screen uh, in a very short period of time. So this is where I want to spend the majority of, of my talk is, is talking about this API security strategy. Dart. Um, it's easy to remember, uh, but it can be applied to an organization that has uh, a security program that's in its infancy, all the way up through a security organization that is an extremely mature uh, security organization, but has a gap associated with APIs. And that's just about everybody. Even the best organizations, uh, I, I've talked to literally hundreds and hundreds of CISOs, um, many of them from Fortune 500 companies that you would expect would have very, very strong and mature cybersecurity programs. And they're still, we find in every single one of them that there are issues associated with their APIs that they didn't know exist. And it's, and it's a surprise to the security team. It, it, it always is. Um, it's not uncommon for me to go to uh, a security, uh, a chief security officer and say, hey, how many APIs do you have in your environment? And the answer is always a shrug. Ask the architect, still a shrug. You know, I sometimes can even ask somebody on the development team, how many APIs do you guys have? And they might be able to give me a number that's within an order of magnitude. But if I ask them to, to tell me about, you know, do you have a catalog of all of them? The answer to that question is typically no as well, because there were APIs that were developed before they put in the right cataloging tools. There were APIs that run in uh, uh, internally only that they suspect, well, they suspect they're internally only, um, and that haven't ever been completely documented. We never find an organization who has their APIs and their uh, all of their uh, catalogs completely up to date and documented with everything that's in their environment. Uh, most of the time, we find at least 30 to 40 percent of the APIs are internal only aren't running through an API gateway and oftentimes those are the ones who that have the least security on them because it was justified by the fact that hey they're not externally exposed unfortunately that's not always the case and of course there are internal uh, threat vectors that are associated with those as well that they should be uh, a little bit concerned about so one of the things that I want to emphasize today is that this dart API security strategy is really our, our thought behind it is to bridge the gap between the security team and the uh, development teams. We want to take away that conflict. We want to remove that, that, uh, that battle that seems to go on constantly between those two, these two organizations. We want to bridge the gap by making it so that organizations can deploy their software faster, they can deploy their APIs faster, and they can uh, either assure that they are already secure, or if they're not secure, the security team isn't wondering what vulnerabilities are left out there. And now they can watch for those vulnerabilities. They can watch to see if something is associated with those. Know ahead of time that, yeah, we weren't able to get everything into this particular API, but we know what the vulnerabilities are. So now we're going to watch for that. And if we see for, uh, an attack against that uh, attack surface, we can block it, we can stop it, we can notify it, we can pull it back, we can do what we need to do. But in the meantime, business is gonna go forward. And that really is our entire mentality. We don't want to be slowing down the development and the, and the implementation of APIs. We wanna help organizations to uh, accelerate the implementation and to work with the, with the uh, development teams to make sure uh, that everybody is aware of what the data is, what the security is of all of those issues, of all those APIs. So the first block is discover. What do we want to discover? We want to discover every single API in the environment. Uh, we want to make sure that we see the, the internal APIs, the external APIs. We want to see the APIs uh, that are <coughs> carrying sensitive data and what kind of sensitive data that they're carrying. Uh, we want to see uh, the, the, the resources that are associated from, uh, with those APIs. Uh, in talking with a number of CISOs, then when they've had issues with an application, when they've had issues with a, a particular API, it was no easy task even to find which EC2 instance that API is on. And I, I'll apologize up front that I use a lot of AWS terms. If you're in Azure and you're using virtual machines or uh, in GCP and have a different environment, uh, I 
I just gravitate towards AWS because that's the one I'm most uh, uh, familiar with. So hopefully you'll be able to take my terms and put them into your own uh, environment, and particularly if you're using a multi-cloud. Um, so I don't mean to uh, in any way advocate for one environment over the other. Um, so, but finding that instance, finding that virtual machine, finding that server name uh, can often be uh, just the first thing that it's like, it's another thing that the security team has to do in order to research that, uh, that troublesome uh, API that's in the environment. And then which app or business unit it belongs to. Uh, this is really important. Uh, and, and part of the reason it's so important, and again, this is back to bridging that gap. If we know exactly which app and business unit it belongs to, then we can automatically take remediation action, and this is jumping forward a little bit in my, in my presentation, but we can automatically notify that business unit or that app development team that, hey, there's an issue there. And when we do it, we can send it to them with Slack or Trello or ServiceNow or Jira, or whatever application, whatever uh, service management uh, process that they're using. We we'll wanna get that information back into their hands in an automated fashion, you know, one of the reasons that security teams, I think, uh, get the uh, reputation of being kind of grumpy and, and Mr. No, uh, I, we used to call our, our security guys Mr. No because they always said no to everything. Um, but the reason they get that is because, quite honestly, most of the security products that they use on, generate thousands and thousands of alerts, and then they have to sift through all those alerts and figure out who's going to respond, which ones are they going to respond to. They, get, they, they suffer from alert overload. Uh, and, and, you know, full kimono because I come out of that community, you know, we used to get thousands of false positives from intrusion detection systems and things like that. And tracking those things down was difficult. What we think should happen is if you can discover the business unit, if you can discover the app, you should be able to associate that with a team and then automatically generate that trouble ticket or whatever needs to be created and send it to that team automatically so that the security team can wash their hands of it. It's done, they've been notified, they, it's out there with them. I can trust that they're going to take care of it. And the security and the, and the development team has all of the information associated with the issue. What's the problem? Where did we find it at? How did we find it? What needs to, what's the corrective action for it? Hopefully in reasonably good technical terms that aren't like cross-site reference forgery. <laughs> uh, from our previous presentation. We want it to be in such a way that those uh, developers can understand it and know how to take care of it. So what else? So that, that's the who, uh, the business unit, the who has that data. Uh, and then of course, the, the data governance. At the end of the day, we can categorize a lot of this data as PCI, PHI, PII, uh, you name it, whatever the, the acronym is. And again, these are security acronyms, payment card industry. Uh, I think it's uh, personal health information. And uh, I don't even remember what PII is, but it's personal information. Um, the bottom line is at the end of the day, we need to know where that data is, where it's going, how it's getting there, who's authorized to that data, and make sure that it's not getting into the hands of the wrong people. And that's where data governance comes into play. And by having that ability to monitor those things, to be able to say, social security number is definitely PII, credit card information is definitely PCI, and then being able to monitor where PCI data is within our environment, and see where it's going, we get a much, much better idea uh, of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that, and, and from a discovery perspective, and I, I kind of talked about it a little bit early uh, in my presentation, was that we might have an API, for example, that is, and I, I hope you can see my mouse, my screen's kind of small, but we might have an API that's communicating between these two uh, EC2 clusters, if you will. And then in this cloud environment, because it's growing so fast, uh, we've put another application out here. We've stood up another EC2 instance. We've borrowed the same load balancer because that, that particular uh, application can run across both of those uh, EC2 instances. And now what's happened is we've, ex we've exposed this internal API through the load balancer directly out to the internet. Uh, oops, excuse me. 
without having to go through the API gateway. As a result, we now have an, an API that otherwise nobody would know was exposed until the bug bounty guy actually captures that API and says, hey, I was able to gather all of your uh, records, internal records, without going through any authentication uh, by, by touching this IP address and this path uh, to get to it. That's not a good way to find out that you've got a problem. So we want to be able to discover those kinds of things, not only by looking at the APIs themselves, but looking at all of the devices that manage and carry that API traffic. So whether it's the API gateway, whether it's the load balancer, whether it's the virtual machine and the configuration of it, by inspecting those devices, you want to be able to discover uh, how they're configured. And once you've discovered how they're configured, then you can do analysis. And again, anal analysis can can run the whole gamut it's the analysis of the api traffic but it's also the analysis of the configuration of these devices um, for example there are hundreds uh, of common misconfigurations uh, that expose apis to more vulnerabilities and i've just listed a couple of uh, a few of those right here internal apis that are accidentally open to the internet like i mentioned before uh, apis with no rate limit or APIs that don't have authentic authentication validation or authentication at all. <laughs> I talk, again, my job is to talk with CISOs and to talk to them about their uh, API securities uh, role and what they're doing in that environment. And I oftentimes position this as you have, uh, uh, for example, I know this would never happen to you, Mr. CISO, but in some environments, you know, in some organizations we've heard that there's a, a bug with an API and the development guy goes out to test the API. And in order to be able to run a lot of tests quickly, uh, he turns off the validation because it makes it a lot easier uh, to do that. He fixes the bug, finds the bug, fixes the bug, and forgets to turn the, uh, uh, the authentication back on. I know that's never happened to you. And they all laugh and say, <laughs> last week, yeah. No, that happened to me last week. Uh, and and I'm, it's, it, it's one of those things that, you know, we want to be able to find those misconfigurations. It's, nobody wants to write bad code and nobody wants to deploy something in an insecure uh, method. But things and accidents happen even after you've gone through all of the testing and everything that you can do uh, in your shift left processes. Things happen and mistakes get made. And as a result, you want to be able to analyze uh, the behavior of those APIs, but also the configuration and of all of the devices that manage those APIs so that you can see those misconfigurations. And speaking of the uh, behavior, uh, one of the things that you should do and, and should consider is, again, AI-based uh, API behavioral analysis, machine learning, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, to be able to model the behavior of every API in your environment by by modeling every single API as opposed to modeling at the application level or even at the environment level or some other level, you can be much more specific about those particular APIs. And uh, so what we encourage folks to do is to uh, model those APIs uh, on an API, on a per API basis. As it turns out, most APIs are very consistent in the way that they behave. Uh, there are exceptions, but most of them are very, very consistent. And only when they're being hacked or when they're being attacked, do they really show uh, significant differences in their behavior. So if you're good at modeling their behavior, you should be able to quickly identify those situations where that particular API is not working well. And then that, of course, leads to a low false positive rate. Uh, and unfortunately, there's a lot of tools out there today uh, that are inaccurate and, and produce too much noise. So let's talk about remediation. Uh, as an organization develops and grows in their maturity level associated with API security, one of the most important things is to be able to remediate quickly. Now, the manual remediation is usually the easiest for the low hanging fruit. Once you've discovered and analyzed your API estate, if you will, the entire environment, both the traffic and all the devices, uh, it's also very uh, it's it's also very very helpful to take care of that low hanging fruit. How do you do that manually? Right, you 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 create a trouble ticket. You send the ticket over to uh, the development team. The development team or the DevOps team fixes the issue, 
and now you've, that problem solved. It's low hanging fruit. It usually is very easy and very, very quick to do. Over a period of time, you may get to a point where some of the issues that you see can be automated to some extent, and you may want to still have a man in the middle. So you want your capabilities, your, your API security strategy to have a semi-automated uh, uh, capability associated with it so that you see a, something happen and you want to remediate it. You can automate the fix, but require a human to push the button to have it take off and go. For example, you may have um, a uh, broken object level authorization identification, and you've seen uh, it happen in your environment. You're, you're concerned about it, that it may happen again. Uh, you create an automation that would automatically revoke a user's credential so that they couldn't gain access to anything anymore. And so, but you don't want to take the chance that that would block something that had a legitimate access to a lot of records within your environment. You don't want that false positive to potentially block real operations from going on. So as a result, you set it up for semi-automated response. And in that particular case, you would see somebody, let's say for example, or see uh, an API that grabbed one record as it was supposed to, and then it grabbed another record as it was supposed to, but then all of a sudden there's a series of failed uh, attempts. And then the last one is, uh-oh, they got access to 500 records. And now there's another 500 records being downloaded. You wanna click that button and say, stop. They shouldn't be doing that. And be able to push the button and stop them. And then the fully automated option is, hey, we're seeing this uh, API that's obviously going through a brute force attack on our environment. Very easy to say that's a brute force. We've identified it a hundred times. It's never been a false positive. Let's just block that IP and make it stop. And those are the fully automated uh, attacks that don't involve a human to push the button. And uh, I see Alyssa, so I must be coming up on my time. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> so, you want to you want to get this last T in the T part of yeah. Time? <laughs> let, let me get the T in. Uh, we also uh, absolutely advocate for for full testing of APIs. Uh, but having a platform that is accessible by the testers, uh, that integrates with your CI CD pipeline, and that also has the ability to, and I know that's an eye test on the right hand side, I apologize, uh, but has the integration with the CI CD pipeline, but also has visibility by both the, uh, uh, the development teams as well as the security teams. We think, again, bridges that gap between the development and security teams so that we can make smart decisions. Uh, when we're deploying these APIs and know ahead of time if they're still vulnerable, uh, what those vulnerabilities are, what to be looking for, and how to remedi remediate them. So again, uh, this was all about DART, the Discover, Analyze, Remediate, Test API Security Strategy. And I'll stop there and ask for questions if, there's, if we have awesome. a minute. Awesome, David. Yeah, we've got a quick minute here. So first of all, thank you for presenting on this content. I think it's really important. I, I'm a big believer in making sure that you have some sort of framework or predefined methodology for performing any kind of testing. You, know, you need to know kind of like as a, your GPS on where you're headed and what you need to make sure you cover before you forget you know, actually covering something, especially addressing the shadow API problem, which is a real problem. Um, one quick question, uh, do you consider Dart to be an alternative framework to something like the penetration testing execution standard? Do you consider it to be more of a framework specific to testing APIs versus other types of web apps? Uh, no, um, good, good, very good question. But the answer is no. Uh, testing is certainly a part of the API uh, test suite, you know, uh, or of Dart uh, as, a, as a whole. So we would encourage pen testing, we would encourage uh, applications. They're not mutually testing. exclusive, right? Not mutually yeah. exclusive. In fact, one of the things that, that we recommend is out of the discovery phase, if you have a really good, uh, now if you have a really good catalog and have a really good swagger spec, send that to your pen test team, send that to your uh, to your team, that your application security testing team, because then they'll be able to give you, without having to search for all of those APIs, they'll be able to give you a much more robust test of those APIs without having to do the, uh, you know, reverse, you know, uh, searching for all the endpoints in the environment. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, David. I know we're out of time, but for those of you who did submit questions, looks like we've got a few that came in. Uh, how can people reach you, David? I'm assuming they can find you on LinkedIn if they want to reach out and learn more about you and your company and also uh, have any questions regarding Dart. Absolutely. I'm David T at nonamesecurity.com or just DT at nonamesecurity.com. Uh, also, I'll put my uh, LinkedIn uh, 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 URL in the uh, in the chat. Awesome, David. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. We hope to see you at a future API Days live event. Thank you so much for coming.